as people arrive, we're just gonna let them into the room. Um, this is our third annual MVP winter webinar. This is the first of three in our webinar series. And this one is entitled Community-Based Problem Solving. And it's just a great opportunity for us to get together and learn about some exciting projects that are taking place in the Commonwealth. And I'm gonna minimize my speaking time as much as possible to give, it, uh, to give our speakers a chance to educate everybody. And I'm just gonna hit the ground running and hand it off to Kara, who is our MVP program manager, who has some MVP program updates. Thanks, Andrew. Oh, yep, there's the right slide. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to kick off our third annual uh, winter webinar series, or can't believe that um, it's been three years since we've started this. So uh, really excited to have you all join us um, and learn from all of these amazing projects that are going on throughout the state. Um, I just wanted to mention that we have two more of these after today. So if you haven't signed up for those, please do so. Um, next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that. Um, next Wednesday, we'll be doing one on uh, heat waves in a changed climate and some projects that are focusing on extreme heat. Uh, and then the next one uh, in two weeks is on the new Massachusetts climate change assessment uh, and going over findings from that report. So that'll be an interesting one uh, for everyone to take part in. Um, as far as other MVP updates, uh, you may have seen if you're on our newsletter that our expression of interest round for FY24 action grants is open. The final deadline for that is February 3rd. So please uh, submit your project ideas prior to that. Um, and you will uh, talk to your RC about your project then uh, before the formal application comes out. We're expecting um, probably in late March this year. Uh, we expect to have around 21 million for that. Um, that grant round. Uh, so excited about that. Um, and uh, we will be scheduling some pre um, request for responses sessions soon for uh, the action grant. Um, so sign up for our newsletter to be notified about that. Um, finally, we have our new uh, MVP deputy director that um, we just hired and she started yesterday. So we're really excited. Uh, that Marissa Robertson has joined us. Um, I don't know, Marissa, if you can unmute yourself and just say a quick hello, um, but she will be, sure. I'm sure, meeting all of you <laughs> very soon. Can you hear me? I, my headphones are yes, being a little can weird. Yes, Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Marissa. Um, I'm coming to the MVP program from MEMA. I have a background in disaster recovery and hazard mitigation. Um, this is my second day so I will be learning with all of you and I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Marissa, we're really excited to have you. Um, next slide, please, Andrew. So speaking of other exciting program updates, uh, you may have also seen um, a lot about this over the past year or so. Um, we are going to be piloting our MVP 2.0 process uh, this starting this spring. Um, we're really excited about this new program. We've gotten a lot of feedback from stakeholders um, about informing how this program will be designed and rolled out. So I'm sure many of you have uh, lent us your insights around the first planning grant um, and what you'd suggest for this updated planning grant program. Uh, so any community that has gone through the first um, MVP planning grant will be uh, eligible to apply for um, MVP 2.0. You can see some of the things that um, we'll be doing through this program, thanks to all the feedback from our stakeholders, um, especially focusing on building capacity um, for equity um, in all of our work uh, and also um, moving from planning to action. So that's gonna be a really key part of this program as well. Um, if you're confused and don't really know what MVP 2.0 is, no worries, we'll have more information sessions as that um, gets rolled out in the spring. Um, the application for that will probably likely be after our action grant. Um, so more likely in the kind of April time period. Um, and if you're interested in piloting this program with us, um, just indicate your interest either on your FY24 action grant um, expression of interest. There's a little box for that on that form uh, or just email your regional coordinator and they'll be happy to talk to you about um, this opportunity. Um, but I don't want to take up any more time because I really want to hear from all of the great um, project leaders in their communities. So um, I'll pass it back to Andrew. 
All right. Thanks, Kira. Um, so a few housekeeping items. Uh, we are recording. Um, if it's going to be posted on our YouTube channel, um, if that's something you're not comfortable with, this is your opportunity to leave leave the webinar. Um, we have a, a system that has been tried and true and tested over the years, and this is the question and answer process. So what we do is people um, submit their questions to the presenters in the chat box. We pull those together at the end of the presentation, and then our, our, our skilled MC, who today will be Carolyn, will be in, responsible for um, kind of popcorn style fielding those questions off of uh, off of our presenters. If you happen to know anybody who's having a hard time uh, logging in through the Windstream uh, platform, there is a login number. Um, it's down here in the lower left-hand corner uh, near the problems logging in question. Um, take a screenshot of that, take a picture of that and send that over to them because um, that gives you the call-in number and they can just call in and listen that way. All right, um, so for us, so as, as Kara mentioned, um, we do have the RFR that's coming out really soon um, in the next few weeks. And this is a time of year where we really like to take projects that are doing exciting, interesting things, and we like to boost those out to the rest of the state. So people who are thinking about their own projects can take lessons from what we're presenting today and what our presenters are gonna present and begin to apply that to their own ideas for how to assemble uh, a presentation. So, so this is the third time we've done it and I've, I've loved every single one of them and I hope you do too. Um, so we have Plymouth and Andover talking about um, specific general, I mean, specific climate-based risks to their communities. And what they've done is they've identified a climate-based risk and they've thought of ways to bring the community into the solution process making it more of a broad-based um, community, uh, community-led, community-driven, community-involved um, uh, process for identifying solutions, which is something that we really uh, prioritize here at the program. It's one of our core principles. So we thought it would be a good idea to bring these forward to you guys so you can uh, think about how they're doing it and maybe learn some, some lessons in the process. And we also have Melissa Preventure uh, from BRPC who can talk to you about the complexities of holding together some of these um, partnerships. They don't come to, together naturally. It takes a lot of work to maintain them. And there's a lot of tools and techniques that you can apply in your own life when you're working. So um, without further ado, we are two minutes ahead of schedule, which is a great place to be. Our first, our first presentation today is gonna be from the town of Plymouth. And we're gonna hear from Lee Hartman, from, uh, who's from the town of Plymouth, Melissa Freddy, uh, the chair lady of the Heron Pond Wampanoag tribe, Frank Mand and Cheryl, Cheryl Heller from the Southeastern Massachusetts Pine Barrens Alliance and Gloriana Davenport from the Living Observatory. And they're gonna talk to you about subterranean resilience, which you might ask yourself, what does that mean? And fortunately we have uh, the next 30 minutes uh, set aside for answering that question. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to you guys and I'm gonna pin you so you'll be at the top of the, everybody's screen. So here we go. Well, thank you, Lee Hartman, Director of Planning and Development for the Town of Plymouth, and I'm starting this off. Uh, this Our uh, efforts here through MVP focuses on the effects of saltwater intrusion on Plymouth Soul Source Aquifer. And I'd like to start off by noting that I've been in the business longer than I want to admit, over 35 years of municipal experience in Massachusetts. And this is the first time I've worked on a program where I've had 13 partners, active partners, in any kind of planning effort whatsoever that I've ever dealt with. So again, I think that's pretty, pretty amazing. I'm just gonna start off with a few slides, just with a little overview of some of Plymouth. And so if we could go to the next slide, please. So again, as I hope, you know, you just back up one, you, just so we can see. So these are the partners we have for our program. And again, very extensive, very proud that we have such a large group of people working together. Next slide. Plymouth is the largest town in the Commonwealth with 103 square miles of land mass. I like to use this slide as an illustration to show how that relates. So if you look at this map, this is Plymouth to scale. It encompasses all of Boston. It goes all down into Milton. Con it contains most of Newton, Cambridge, Brookline, and goes up into Waltham and as far north as Lexington. So again, it's, it's an easy way or a good way to visualize just the complexities of a town of Plymouth with uh, such a large landmass when you compare it to other communities. Next slide. And just a few things, population of 63,000 uh, about, 
75 percent of all the rare and endangered uh, 75 rare and endangered species that are identified in massachusetts can be found in plymouth it's, a, it's probably one of the higher numbers of uh, species found in any community it has the largest sole source second largest sole source aquifer only uh, second to cape cod 37 miles of co coastline. And the next one with GIS, I used to doubt this, but, but it, everybody used to say we have a pond for every day of the year. And I kind of doubted that for years until I went through and looked at GIS. And, and yes, I can confidently say we have over, we have more than one pond for every day of the year in the town of Plymouth and a very globally rare coastal pine barrens also in the community. Next slide. And this just is a map of the natural heritage areas, vernal pools and habitat. And again, you can see and try to even visualize that over the Boston area, how much of the community is, in, is uh, identified as habitat for rare and endangered species, threatened species. Next slide. And at that, this point, I'm going to turn this over. I think we were going to Frank Manns next and uh, turn this over to Frank. Thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Frank Mand. I'm the vice president of the, Mass the Southeastern Massachusetts Pine Barrens Alliance, SEMPA for short. Um, when we first began to consider this, we were the, the original authors of the application. And when we first began to consider this application, we were excited to see that community outreach was a major element in a successful application. We were excited because in large part, that's what our organization, SEMPA, does normally. We build alliances, uh, we cross borders, we think in terms of a broader audience or issues that are shared across organizations and municipal boundaries. From what we could tell though, traditionally MVP grants accomplishes their outreach from the outside in. The work begins usually at the municipal level, the city or town hires a consultant and the consultant reaches out to the community. Our intention uh, from the beginning was to begin with community from the inside we felt and have a number of community organizations that we normally deal with or come into contact with or have in common produce the events and activities relative to their constituents. We didn't have a specific predefined notion of what those events or activities would be. We simply asked for relevance to the subject matter of our project, which was saltwater intrusion. And so the focus of our outreach elements naturally evolved and they became our community's increasing concern for water quality, every community's, I suppose. So to cite a few examples, and you'll hear more specifics later in this presentation, our interest in the MVP was spurred initially by our discovery that several freshwater ponds adjacent to our headquarters on Cape Cod Bay were being affected by rising sea levels and storm surge. So our outreach effort was focused on educating the public about saltwater intrusion and laying the groundwork for a community water testing laboratory that was going to be an intentional legacy of this MVP grant, it was part of our application. In the case of the League of Women Voters, another one of our partners, and in association with Sustainable Plymouth and the Plymouth Public Library, their outreach efforts uh, were producing an ongoing program called Read Up the Storm. In the case of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe and the Indigenous Resource Collaborative, two other partners, their outreach approach resulted in the production of special events that celebrated the importance of water in indigenous cultures. In the, in, case, in the case of our partner, the Living Observatory, the initial goals have evolved to produce another legacy project of this MVP grant entitled One Water, which you'll hear more detail about, but it would, I would describe it as a chronicle of each of our MVP partners' efforts, as well as other community and regional organizations' projects that are focused on water issues. And while these various outreach efforts were being undertaken, our partners at UMass Amherst were creating a new detailed hydrogeological map of the region that will highlight our vulnerability to saltwater intrusion, as well as provide additional data um, that can be utilized in the general uh, fight to preserve water quality. 
So that's some of the general overview of what we were trying to do and, and uh, who was accomplishing that. So now you'll hear from some of our other partners as well. Thank you. I think you can move to uh, the next slide, yes. Thank you, Frank, for that. And thank you, Lee, uh, before. And thank you for um, having us here today. This is wonderful. So, Waniki uh, Suk, Natasiris, Melissa Ferretti, Nu Tomas, Sikwana Makwapakwit, Kanatai Bornat, good day. My name is, I am called Melissa Ferretti. Uh, my genealogy is Herring Pond Wampanoag, and I live in Bourne. So I'm a Herring Pond Wampanoag mother and grandmother raised by an elder of my tribe in Cedarville, a small village in Plymouth. I have lived in Plymouth and on my homelands my whole life. And why is that important? I add that every time I do a presentation because we're here today because of this relationship that we have created through this MVP project. And for indigenous people, understanding the deep connection that we have to our land um, and the water, which are both intrinsic is, is super important. So I always make sure I say that so that people understand um, growing up in Cedarville and being raised on these lands is just critical to the work that we're doing today with groups and um, that we have in this project. We can probably move on to the next slide. So I, I always start with a little bit about the Herring Pond uh, Wampanoag tribe and the lands. And as you can see, we, we all saw Lee's map that defined the, the size and the, 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 you know, the numbers and to get that about the size of our of Plymouth. So as you look at this map here, um, we just really like to educate people on what the land may have looked like for Herring Pond Wampanoags prior to um, colonization and even after. So this is a map um, of the, the divided lands of the Herring Pond tribe. We always talk about um, 3,000 acres. It seems it's a lot. Uh, three different parcels the, that we had. Uh, one being the great lot, 20, about 2,600 acres. The meeting house lot, about 200 acres, where our um, Indian meeting house still sits today. And the Herring River lot, which is down half a part, partly in Plymouth and partly in Bourne and extends almost over to Redbrook. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. So when we talk about these relationships and in, in, with indigenous people, and obviously um, our, our task for this project was to, as uh, Frank said, conduct sort of walks and um, educate on the, this connection that we're talking about. But what we always need to remember in these, these relationships is that's really where it starts, right? Uh, indigenous people um, building trust and getting to know people and understanding one another and our goals is really important for these, these um, initiatives to work. So we've done a, quite a few different um, events. Um, this one here was a collaboration with the Community Art Collaborative and um, Pilgrim Hall. And many of the folks that are part of this MVP project obviously attended the walk that we did at Dinah Pass. We weren't able to talk about Dynapath, and that's really a whole nother, uh, a whole nother presentation. But Dynapath is a six acre parcel that was returned to, um, deeded back to Herring Pond in 2019. And we use that as an example, although it's not on the water. Uh, it really, as I said, the land and the water are connected for indigenous people. So it was really important that we went to Diana Path to introduce people who are in this project and, and the public to this. And at Diana Path, as you can see here, much of this work that was done was came from the land. The, the, there was ink made from the berries that were found there. There was, um, the leaves were used in the artwork that, that was presented at this, 
this um, art collaborative with the Plymouth Schools and the Pilgrim Hall. So it really just gives you an idea of the importance of all of that. So the MVP project, as we go on to the new year, we hope to do another walk. So our next walk would be targeted towards, we would go to probably somewhere like Ellisville or, other, or another seaside um, spot to do this walk and talk about saltwater intrusion. We know that indigenous people, we, we fish and we hunt and we gather and being able to have access to these places that we get our food from is, is critical to our cultural and our heritage moving forward. So we're really excited about this project. I know that we've all had that sort of one thing that has been COVID, but we're, we're all getting back into balance now. And I feel that this is just a really critical year for not only the communication and the collaborations that we're, we're doing here in this project, but just to um, get ourselves back into this balance and to connect once again. So we're really excited about the future of this project. Um, I'm not sure if we have another slide. I think that's maybe, oh, so here we go. Yeah, our final slide. So once again, as indigenous people, the water and the land is just critical. Um, we have a picture of my son and I always like to share this. He did a recently, well, it was actually last year, but he did a, an, an interview with the Cape Cod Times and it was on winter, winter fishing and ice fishing and indigenous people now. And as you see, if we take a second look to remember how beautiful mother nature is, we might treat it differently. So I'm really excited about the year and I really thank you all for being here. I could go on and I, I forever and talk about the work that we, we hope to do, but I know we only have a little bit of time and I, I wanna hear from Gloriana and the, and the rest. So thank you so much, uh, we're excited. So I'm Judy Savage and I represent the League of Women Voters um, who as a group have been very pleased to be invited to be partners um, in this project. The League um, in the last several years has been doing water forums for the community on water conservation, sole source, source aquifer protection, and most recently the anticipated impact of sea level rise on our community. So it seemed like a uh, natural fit in many ways to provide community outreach and education for this project. And we really wanted to partner with another organization called Sustainable Plymouth because we are both community-based organizations dedicated to advance communication, education, and to ensure a just, healthy, and sustainable Plymouth. The League had recently done a uh, online book group discussion on the book Rising Dispatches from a New American Shore by Elizabeth Rush. And it began a discussion which many of us felt needed to be expanded and continued. So our education and engagement goal for this project was to cast a wider net and attract and engage people who were not the usual attendees at our forums and workshops and to do it with books and conversation. There are so many excellent books that have been coming out on climate change of late. And to get, any, to get even more people talking, reading and asking questions about climate disruption, we decided to partner with the Plymouth Public Library to create an ongoing community read, which we named Read Up a Storm. Rather than choose just one book for our read, we curated and compiled a list initially of over 40 and now 100 and growing climate change themed books. The Plymouth Public Library posted the ones available through their system on their Goodreads page. The list included genres to satisfy every reader and every book club in Plymouth. It included science, fiction, history, natural resources, indigenous knowledge, mystery, yeah, there are many mystery books with a climate themed um, story, memoir, science fiction, and fantasy. 
We invited existing book groups to choose one or more books from their list for their own discussions. The library list could be accessed by scanning a QR code on a bookmark and flyer that we designed and had printed. We included a link to a list of possible questions for book group discussion and contact information if a group would like a facilitator to lead a discussion. The bookmarks and flyers were distributed and posted in the main library, the branch library, and community bulletin boards. Two large read up of storms, you can see the banner here, banners were made, and one was hung in the main li library, and the other is kind of a traveling banner that goes to wherever we have workshops. The flyer and larger book list were posted on the library website, the One Water site, the League of Women Voters website, the SEMPA website and Sustainable Plymouth website and Facebook page. We wrote press releases for our local newspaper and posted flyers in local bookstores and in town hall. In addition, when we can advance to the next slide, three larger open to the public read up a storm community sessions, including local authors and experts in the field were invited to attend the first event was at the Wildlands Trust, which is our local land trust. The second one was at the main library and the third one at the branch library. We brought box loads of books from the library to each event and spread them out on display tables for everyone to peruse. Folks were invited to talk about a book that had a significant impact on their understanding of the importance of environmental action. We invited ringers, folks familiar to residents for their public involvement and contribution to environmental action, including town employees and elected town committee members. Our local state Senator Susan Moran attended our first session. Everyone talked about books that changed their lives and in many cases started them out on their current career paths. No one left without the name of at least one new book they wanted to read. Folks networked, learned about saltwater intrusion and organizations and events they could join if interested while enjoying the company of new and old friends. We discovered authors we didn't know were in the community. We had one science teacher um, who had just written a book for middle-aged students and he came and brought and talked about his book. The flyers, bookmarks, banners, and Goodreads list will remain at the main library going forward, hopefully even after the actual project is over. That's our legacy. We hope folks continue to read and talk about climate disruption, sea level rise, and the impact on our wells, drinking water, and coastline. We hope that it will encourage understanding of the importance of getting involved. Our goal was to plant a seed of awareness, which will hopefully continue to grow and inspire some much needed awareness and action in town. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. <clears throat> thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you to the MVP folks who are running this webinar. It's wonderful to be able to have our, our work shared to a broader audience um, and to all the presenters for being here today. I'm Gloriana Davenport. I'm president of Living Observatory, a public interest learning collaborative of scientists, artists, wetland practitioners, and others. We are largely focused on wetland restoration of cranberry farmland. But we were drawn to this project not only because we believe water is our most important and fragile resource, but also because part of our philosophy at Living Observatory is to make our natural resources and the communities that protect them more visible. And I think this uh, project really drew on many of those communities, but there are also many more in Plymouth. And we wanted to amplify the impact of this MVP grant by creating a website, One Water that can support a growing collection of partners and projects that seek to protect Plymouth's water resources through science, conservation, outreach, and learning. You can go to and explore the site at onewater.livingobservatory.org. Next slide, please. The meat of uh, this site are partners and projects. 
partners are responsible for building their own profiles, project pages, and posting updates and data. Uh, we do not do the editorial for each partner. Each partner does their own editorializing. This page shows a few of the MVP related projects that have been recently updated. A community water testing station that Frank spoke of, volunteer based saltwater intrusion monitoring and testing of well water, storied walks focusing on the hydrology of Plymouth, which I think both Melissa is involved in, but also Malcolm McGregor, who represents the Wellands Trust. Next slide, please. The science contribution for this MVP grant is led by Dr. David Bout, who at we've worked with at Living Observatory since the beginning. He is a professor and head of graduate admissions in the Department of Geosciences in the School of Earth and Sustainability at University of Mass Amherst. His goal is to update the model of groundwater flow for the Plymouth Kingston Carver Aquifer to believe it or not, the older model, which was designed for other uses, um, does not take into account all the streams and ponds of Plymouth, which is quite interesting. Uh, when his model is optimized, he will be able to make predictions about saltwater intrusion in the context of sea level rise and climate change. In his most recent update, you can go to that model domain map. That next slide, please. Uh, this is the model domain map. You can see it doesn't cover the whole of the aquifer. This is because we're really focused on the coastline. Uh, next slide. Uh, when we translate this into the model, what you see is the freshwater, which is blue. And on top of that is a layer of red, which is the salt water, the salt water being more buoyant. And if we go to the cross sections, uh, right, you see this uh, line of red, which is salt water, sort of coming into what you would almost expect to be blue. And that's because that uh, cross section actually goes into Plymouth Harbor. Um, how good is the model? Next slide, please. Uh, so this shows you the observed from piezometer measurements in, the, uh, in Plymouth. Uh, the, the observed measurements next to the model um, and the model prediction for ground level. It, what is good about this is uh, it shows that the model really aligns pretty well on the diagonal axis, but it does not align perfectly. Uh, on, uh, the, the piezometers are offset from that model line. So we have to tweak the model in order to make it more realistic, after which we can, or Dr. Bout can begin doing some predictions. Uh, next slide, please. So there are many more projects on the One Water site. Again, you can go there at onewater.livingobservatory.org. And um, we hope to, over the next few months, get many more projects from different uh, local groups who are testing their waters and uh, educating people about use of water in the Plymouth region. Thank you. Okay, folks. So that is our presentation from our Town of Plymouth uh, partnership. And what we're gonna do now is we're going to um, seed some questions and we're gonna have a little bit of time uh, for Q&A. Um, if people have questions in the chat box, we're gonna pull those from the chat box. If not, then uh, we have some of our own questions here that we've, we've uh, designed to get people thinking. Um, so I would like to um, request that Carolyn um, join us and begin the process of firing some Q&As off. We have, uh, we have about five minutes for Q&As. Awesome, thank you, Andrew, and thank you all for that uh, for that presentation. Um, you know, I think it really showed how many how many partners were contributing to this work. Um, to have all of you provide, uh, you know, your your piece of the project, really, really helpful. Um, I don't see any direct questions in the chat, so feel free to put some in there. 
Um, oh, one just popped up here. Um, can the process of saltwater intrusion be reversed or are most of the groups hoping to stop it from advancing? So kind of an overarching question about the your final goals here with this work. Does anyone wanna take that? Um, I would say, I, I don't know in terms of the uh, Plymouth Harbor, you know, I, I'm very familiar with the Boston Harbor situation, but in general, I think you, we probably can't really uh, stop saltwater intrusion. Um, Mother Nature is very powerful and um, uh, the coast is, uh, has changed over the years, over many years. It's changed based on uh, storms and activities. Um, but what we can do is we can make some predictions about where new town water wells might be best located to avoid uh, a risk of saltwater intrusion. And we can uh, make similar uh, recommendations for private landowners. Mm. So this process of educating is really important so that you know when you decide to drop a well down, what is the likelihood of 10 or 30 years from now uh, that well not being quality drinking water. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, we have a few, the questions are coming in hot now. Um, so one question um, about outreach and the engagement programs um, that you know this project has done so well on, um, which were the easiest to implement and what would you say has had the greatest success so far? Well, I, I'm going to jump in here. Um, this is Judy from the League of Women Voters. I think each one had aspects that um, were challenging. Um, but I think the thing that made our project easier was that we already knew um, who the other possible partners were in reaching out um, in a broader way. So we didn't have to recreate the wheel. We were already connected with a lot of these groups. So it, it was relatively easy to make a phone call, relatively easy to convince people about the importance of doing this. And once we had the right players on board um, to put the pieces in place to move forward. And, and we learned a lot. We, we didn't know a lot about QR codes and posting on Goodreads pages, but it all kind of fell together once we started meeting with the various partners. Yeah, there are, um, you know, a, a lot of folks are curious about these partnerships. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Chairwoman Melissa, did you want to uh, add something? I saw you on mute. I think I was just going to add to Judy, and I thank you, Judy, for, for sharing that. I, you know, I, the read up a storm, and I think the, you know, the one water site for me, you know, going in, I, I think have been just wonderful. I, I think as Indigenous people, we um, often struggle to figure out where we fit in and, and how um, our knowledge will sort of incorporate with the Western science. So um, I think it says, what did we learn? I think for us as native people, the traditional knowledge sort of comes easy, right? We've been on the water. We know we've been affected by saltwater intrusion because the, you know, it's now the bays where we used to be able to fish and get our scallops and our shellfish are now you know, gunk and no eel grass and just, you can't fish there. So I think the, you know, the lessons learned for us at, on our end would be, you know, this Western science that we're, we're all trying to embrace right now that, you know, we're, we're not scientists, uh, but we are in another way. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Judy. So I think we have time for one more question. Can I just respond to Melissa for a second? Because I think she brings up such a wonderful point one of the reasons for trying to make a website is to allow multiple perspectives to be present and to show up so that people understand we're not, we're not all science and science can't totally solve the problem. Understanding the role of nature um, and 
uh, readjusting our relationship with nature, which is what I think Melissa does so wonderfully, is equally important. Thank you. So I think we have time for maybe one more question and some of the questions that have shown up in the chat box. What we're going to do is we're going to slide those to the end so that we can kind of kind of ask of the whole panel. Does that work for everyone? Sure. We'll, we'll be working diligently on our end to try to make sense of this in a way that flows. Yeah, and a, and a lot of the questions are overarching about different partnerships um, and good strategies. So um, I think that will lead to some great discussion at the end with, with all of our presenters. So thank you all for your, for your thoughtful questions. Cool. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I just I just talked myself out of one more question and I talked myself into advancing uh, to, to Joyce's <laughs> yes, presentation. I think so. <laughs> because, because it makes sense. Um, so I, sit tight, we'll ask some of those questions or answer some of those questions that just came in in a more broad overarching way. So um, one of the things, so it's interesting is because the last presentation we were discussing water in the wrong place, which is and going underground into places where people uh, get their drinking water from and where they are impacted in their you know, fisheries um, in a negative way. And this is a project where we're talking about too much water in the wrong place in a different way, where it's overland flow and the interrelationship between built environments and, um, and flooding. And again, it's like, it's a big question. It's a big problem. It sounds scary. And when we address these things, these things together, um, what we end up with is a less scary situation that is more likely to pr produce um, results. Um, and it might take a while to get to the results. And I think what we're going to talk about is some of the different processes that can be followed. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joyce, Joyce Lucic Yang from the town of Andover, uh, who is the Director of Sustainability and Energy. And she's going to talk about her Shawshin River Land Conservation Planning Project, which is um, an MVP uh, Action Grant funded project. So Thank Joyce. you, Andrew. Uh, can you all hear me? Loud and clear. Sort of, okay, great. Perfect. Um, well, it's really, truly a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Joyce. I work for the town of Andover as its Director of Sustainability uh, and Energy. I just want to thank the organizers of this webinar uh, for giving us an opportunity to highlight our project uh, and to sort of share some of our lessons learned. Um, so if you see here on the cover uh, of the slides, um, this is actually just at the beginning of our trip out uh, into Andover uh, in terms of our open safe space parcels. We were doing a field assessment. Modeling is one thing, it's always great to confirm uh, with actual boots on the ground, as you see here. Um, I thought it might be hard to actually convince a group of people to go out in the middle of December. This was December 12th last year uh, on, on a Sunday <laughs> where there might be a football game. Uh, but you know, we, we have a whole bunch of very connected and very committed uh, people who care about this project uh, and was not hard at all to get 20 or so of us out there into the field to really assess uh, the land parcels that we were screening. So um, just want to, to share a little bit, um, go back in time really to the start of the project. Uh, this project's about three years in the making and along the whole way, uh, we've been blessed really with a great sense of public involvement and really empowerment uh, to guide, guide this project from the get-go. So next slide, Andrew. All right, so like many communities, our MVP um, process really begin uh, with the Community Resilience uh, Building Workshop. So there's a, at the end of these workshops, there is produced a summary of findings, a report, and that really documents the community conversations. Uh, for Andover, it actually was not hard to convince people to join in this resilience building and resilience planning um, effort. Um, as you'll see here, the process began in January to June of 2019, um, but really it was postponed uh, because of the Columbia gas disaster that affected uh, three communities uh, in the Merrimack uh, Valley. So with that as the backdrop, uh, this was a workshop that was, had, you know, that was supposed to take place in the fall and instead had to be postponed. People really understood 
um, the urgency in having credible plans and the importance of doing resilience planning because they you know, have very, very fresh um, memories of how disruptive a hazardous event could be. So it was not hard to get people together to have these conversations. Um, the top hazard that was identified during the community resilience building workshop was uh, flooding in terms of climate vulnerabilities. Uh, the top, top recommendation, of course, uh, was to then take a strategic program of land acquisition along riverways to provide flood storage. So this, this process really predated me, but I took the recommendation to heart uh, and, the, and the hazard findings to heart. Uh, and we formulated a project together to address uh, this top recommendation. And that's really the start of our MVP, um, our MVP project. So next slide, please. Uh, so just like the importance of disaster planning wasn't um, far off in the minds of our workshop participants, um, really flooding and, and having a deep rooted knowledge of what that looks like, uh, you didn't really have to stretch that much further really for Andover to have a reckoning um, with uh, flooding and what, what we can do about it and what we should do about it. So the motivation I think has always um, been there. Uh, and like many other communities, our story of flooding is in part, you know, sort of the climate change and, and the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is also in part a story about the consequences of land use change and, and planning. Um, so shown here is a photograph uh, that was taken by uh, a reporter for the Andover Townsman, which is our local paper, uh, and was done, you know, um, in the middle of March in 2010. Uh, and this is a picture of the devastation um, from too much water at the wrong place. And this is, uh, you know, the Shawshin River, which is the subject of our MVP action grant. Um, and, you know, uh, a, a main thoroughfare through Andover on its way to, to Lawrence in the Merrimack um, of the river flooding after two or three consecutive days of, of rain. Over eight inches fell over the space of 48 plus hours and it caused major, major disruptions. Uh, roads were closed, many roads were closed, schools were closed, homes evacuated, hundreds. Um, shops were closed, um, utilities shut off, and people lost a lot of things. And I think that face on the photograph really tells you the sense of loss and despair and not knowing when relief was going to come and not knowing what state you were gonna find your home in. Um, and like I said, the story really goes far beyond that. This is not the first time a significant flood has happened in Andover. Four years prior was the Mother's Day flood of 2006. A similar story, and even before that in 1930s and before that. So this is something that's been happening uh, in Andover for a long time, and our predictions and models tell us this is the type of thing that will happen more frequently uh, with climate change. So I want to go to the next slide and show you the place where this photograph was taken. Uh, right there, right smack dab in the middle of the photograph, you see uh, encircled, this is the Washington Park uh, condominiums where the gentleman was evacuated from. There was no way to reach that complex by road because all of North Main Street that runs basically you know, horizontal to your slide uh, was completely closed. And you can see, and you're not surprised uh, that the Washington Park condos was flooded. Uh, this is an aerial photograph taken recently in 2021. Uh, it's right smack dab in the middle of the oxbow of the river. So the river is that serpentine thing that winds its way from basically the left of the photo all the way to the right. Um, and what you're seeing here is the river is flowing from basically south of town uh, to north um, to, to Lawrence. And uh, 
you know, right there is the Washington Park condos, um, right as as the water is rushing um, to to the mouth and it's opening at the Merrimack. And you can also see a shopping plaza uh, to the left of it that was also uh, underwater uh, on uh, in March of 2010. Now I want you to notice some other features of this photograph um, because we're about to do some magic and turn back time. So you can see here on the left, uh, on the right bottom corner, um, a bunch of homes and, and developments. And you can also see, you know, sort of um, in the upper part of the photograph, um, houses and, and developments uh, along North Main Street. So if you turn back time and we can queue up Cher um, as a song, you can see there in 1936, um, Washington Park condo uh, did not exist and neither did the shopping plaza to the left of it. But a lot of other developments along Burnham Road on the you know sort of the right uh, bottom corner were there along with other developments along North Main Street. Now, Land use change is absolutely a big part of our flooding story and planning decisions have consequences on the lives and the livelihoods of, of people um, and businesses. Uh, and somebody surely knew in 1936 that it wasn't such a great idea to build along that parcel of road. Um, and that there were probably wetlands that served to buffer the rush of water as it came down the Shawshank on its way to meet the Merrimack during heavy rainstorms. Um, but somewhere along the way, we lost that knowledge and that buffer that used to exist no longer does. And developments that were cited, you know, between 1936 and, you know, the, the uh, nine, late 1900s happened. And really the question now for us is, what do we do about it? What can we do to fix it so that we never have to see a face like that again? So, so that is really kind of where we find ourselves at the beginning of our action grant for the MVP. So next slide, please. Um, was to really identify now new parcels of land or maybe existing parcels of lands along the Shashin River that might restore some of that buffering function, that might restore some of that uh, water holding potential. Um, and how we did that was uh, through overlaying many, many um, layers of maps through the GIS um, and looking at the parcels of, of land and really doing an assessment both in the computer as well as in, in real life, walking the, the parcels to understand which of them may be the most opportune for us to do restoration work uh, and to acquire it if it was you know, privately held at this point uh, to sort of restore some of that function and to turn back the time if you will. Uh, step two was to say, well, how much would each of these parcels or a combination of parcels uh, do in terms of really um, giving us the flood protection impact? Uh, so what we're doing is uh, like the prior story, doing some um, hydrology and hydraulic studies to ask what, what might, you know, sort of turning the clock into the future, if we had this uh, strategy and if we were able to carry it out, what would be the impact um, in terms of mathematical models to a hundred year flood event uh, like the ones that we saw uh, in 2010. So, so that is really sort of the outline and the objectives of our MVP, uh, two rounds of MVP action grants in fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23. But really along the way, um, we have a bunch of really talented uh, and committed people who came with us on the journey and, and again, were there from very uh, first day. So I wanna talk about this almost in a way of concentric circles uh, in uh, a tree um, and how we went about the process. Um, much more conventional, I would say, it wasn't a, a group that was already pre-assembled and working together from day one. Uh, we really built up our community along the way. Um, so next slide. 
First, um, in terms of empowering stakeholders, we identified you know, sort of the affinity groups who might have a overlapping interest uh, in this work. Uh, and Andover, there's sort of three or four primary uh, affinity groups is what I would call it. Um, Andover Village Improvement Society is a private land trust. Uh, other than Andover Conservation, they hold the most amount of uh, uh, land uh, that are preserved uh, for open space. Um, Andover Trails uh, is a recreational group that really is trying to connect uh, parcels of land uh, for a contiguous trail that runs along the Shawshin. They have a vision uh, of a Shawshin Greenway. Um, and so the goals and objectives of the MVP project uh, really align very well with their own objectives to have a contiguous uh, trail uh, along the Shawshin. Uh, we have a very active open space task force as a branch off from our conservation commission. Uh, and so the Conservation uh, Commission itself, as well as the Open Space Task Force, along with staff, would be what we call sort of our core affinity groups, uh, whose visions and goals really do overlap uh, with our MVP projects in terms of uh, climate resilience and flood protection. Uh, and so uh, this was a photo of us uh, going out and assessing the field uh, conditions. But, but prior to that, we provided training uh, or Fuss and O'Neill, our technical advisors on the project provided training uh, for these divinity groups so that as we uh, spread out throughout the promising parcels that were identified in the computer modeling, uh, everybody would have a, you know, sort of a baseline of what we're looking for uh, and a score sheet um, that would uh, be harmonized uh, and the definite uh, to go ahead and, and assess. Um, like I said, it was not hard to get the uh, participants uh, and to get them involved uh, in completing the um, field assessment, uh, even in a very cold day and mucky day in, in December. So uh, next slide. And then um, branching out to the next concentric circle, um, you're basically asking in terms of stakeholders, whom does the work uh, impact? And it's not really a, a, a big stretch now to tell you that we met with the Washington Park, Park Condo uh, Board of Trustees um, in, in, uh, for this project uh, to discuss the impacts of this project um, and the potential benefits of acquiring land uh, to provide for uh, flood mitigation and flood protection. Um, they gave us a lot of great feedbacks. Um, they very much wanted to be continually updated. Um, they have um, taken on themselves a lot of uh, planning and um, flood mitigation and, um, and evacuation planning, flood protection planning in terms of sandbags and, and others. So they're very active in protecting and shoring up um, their own resilience uh, and has been a great partner uh, for the town. Um, we have also worked with them on this year in terms of funding a um, US Geological Service stream gauge. Uh, they use that gauge along with the NOAA uh, website um, as early warning systems for flood evacuation and flood um, planning execution. Um, and of course, Andover is probably not alone in this. We will be updating our hazard mitigation plan uh, and exploring other FEMA MEMA uh, opportunities. Uh, and Washington Park Condos is a, is, a, is a great partner for us on that front as well. So going one more concentric circle out, um, next slide is really sort of um, probably in my mind, the most exciting portion of, of this work, which is the engagement uh, with youth as stakeholders. Uh, you will probably find no less passionate of a group of individuals who care about climate change than our youth. They all know about it, even though it's not a big part of their curriculum. Um, and they see their futures as inextricably intertwined with the trajectory of action on climate change. 
so probably I think the defining moment was bringing together the youth of all of Merrimack Valley, not just uh, Andover, uh, but the several private schools in the region, Brooks Academy and Phillips Academy, along with the Abbott Lawrence Academy in Lawrence. And the four you know, schools came together to write a joint youth statement on climate. It was just absolutely powerful um, and brilliant. It was not something the grownups and their faculty advisors really you know, sort of did for them that they wanted to initiate this themselves. Uh, and they talked about that process of wor working across borders uh, at the Andover Climate Summit that we hosted um, in April, uh, along with the, the youth contest. So this is a picture of them sitting together um, at a panel, you know, sort of reading their joint statement and talking about the work together for an audience of over 100 people. Um, so it was, in my mind, uh, I still think about that moment and I get goosebumps about how fortunate we are uh, to have engaged with such a powerful group um, of, of stakeholders and how important this work is to them uh, and the futures that they see for their communities. Um, it was much easier getting them to work together on project uh, than necessarily municipal stakeholders um, um, working on projects together. So somehow they know intrinsically how, how this works. Um, so next slide. Um, really then going out one more concentric circle out was really meeting people beyond the towns, um, meeting with family members uh, of in, in Methuen on a, you know, sort of day of fun and recreation at the Greater Lawrence Boathouse uh, Summerfest. Uh, so this was our very last activity last year. Um, and uh, the boathouse is based in Lawrence and it gives recreational opportunities to, to families in uh, the Merrimack Valley to uh, learn how to sail or to kayak uh, along the Merrimack. Uh, so they had a fun fest uh, and Bob and I were there with our Andover Mobile Town Hall <laughs> uh, and talking to people about the MVP project and doing real live demonstrations of what a difference vegetation has and what, uh, how it in, in, improves the holding capacity uh, of uh, soil. Uh, so we ran uh, water along the turf, uh, which was seeded with grass versus a kitty litter plan just full of dirt. So as you could imagine, as you run the water, the water is able to slough off very, very clean. Whereas if you didn't have vegetation there, you would see basically the impacts of erosion. So we made this understanding um, hopefully easy and accessible for children and families who are there. Uh, and then to broach the subject of um, the work of climate change and climate resilience work in their community. Um, and right there on the mobile town hall, you actually see one of our student interns who was helping us set up uh, that day as well. So, so really going beyond uh, Andover to engage uh, with the larger, you know, sort of watershed level uh, of people about this work. Um, so uh, what's, uh, what are we doing this year? <laughs> Uh, so the engagement never ends. It's always a part and parcel of um, yeah, the MVP project. So really, I'm talking about a real tough group here. Advance the slide, please. Um, oh, yeah, before I get there, um, sort of the words to live by. Uh, nothing about us without us. Um, and the saying, it comes from the Latin, and I won't even uh, say the Latin, my Latin's non-existing. Um, but that, you know, the same really means that policies should be decided by the full and direct participation of the members of the groups affected by the policy. And it just means that if, if you haven't created a seat at the table for the people as you're going about your work, you should. And the people who learn about the project should ask and demand for a seat at the table because this is really, the work is about them. Uh, and so these are in my mind, this is sort of the model of the MVP program. And I, I think by extension, a lot of local governments work 
um, because we really want to create these seats at the table uh, for everyone, because this is something that cuts across all social demographics and cuts across the entire community. So um, next slide. Um, and when you do that, um, you get words like this. I mean, I treasure this much more so than I treasure uh, <laughs> my paycheck per se. Um, wanted to thank you for as a, a letter from a resident of the Washington Park condos, uh, supporting the River Gauge funding at Andover. I was through the flood of 2010, unit was damaged out of my home for nine months. Having the local gauge means a lot. Being able to see the forecast of the river that's besides my home gives me a feeling of comfort, knowing if and when I need to be concerned. And having a voice for us means a lot. So, so that's that's really what, what I do this stuff for. Um, and to know that they have a seat at the table means a lot to me as well. So uh, next slide. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna skip forward because I'm starting to run out of time. Uh, we are continuing this work with the modeling of the river physiology to tell us which of these parcels really are gonna be meaningful and just by how much, trying to quantify that. Um, next slide. All right, so uh, stakeholders internal stakeholders. Uh, we are branching out beyond conservation and the sort of outdoorsy uh, people uh, to our hardcore engineers uh, are getting involved. And to my surprise and delight, they were more than happy to get into their waders and jump into the river and uh, to, to get the bathymetric uh, measurements of the Shawsheen. Uh, this fall. Um, and that is all of those measurements are going into the hydraulic and, um, and hydrologic model of the Shawshane for this year. Uh, and so uh, trying to extend that uh, concentric circle to also our internal groups uh, of folks and, and getting their buy-in as well. So I believe that might be my last slide. Happy to take your questions, of course. I uh, just want to thank all the individuals who have been along this journey with me, Bob Douglas, the Director of Conservation, Nili Puellos, uh, formerly of the City of Lawrence, who's our uh, Assistant Town Engineer, Jeff Carey, our GIS uh, magician, the Fuss and O'Neill team, Julie, Alex, Chelsea, Lara, um, as well as our um, fearless uh, MVP regional coordinator, Michelle, who's been just a great um, resource for us and, and guidance for the project. Um, happy to take your questions. Awesome, uh, thanks Joyce. So one of the things to take, that I take away from this is there's no wrong way to go about building partnerships, right? So you had the Plymouth example where you had this sort of like core of people who are hardcore dedicated to this work and they approach the town and the town says, yeah, let's do it. And then you have Joyce's model in Andover where she started with what she knew and she kept building upon that. And so it's great that we get to show you two different ways of building these partnerships. And I'll stop editorializing and I'll go over to, to Carolyn so she can uh, do the Q and A's. Thank you, Andrew. No, those, that was a very uh, helpful insight. Um, I do want to say, to thank Judy who um, answered one of the, the questions um, from the Plymouth um, project about um, policy and regulation. Um, so I'll just read her answer to make sure you've all seen it. We recognize that aligning policy and regulations would only happen when our policymakers were convinced that these are important issues to the voting public. Engaging the public without bumming everyone out is part of the challenge, but helping everyone connect as well as seeing the importance of connection with each other in the environment was one strategy. It has led to more actions and engagement from our policymakers and community groups, but much more work needs to be done. Um, so thank you, Judy, for that. Um, we did have one question come through about, or a, hand, a few questions come in uh, for Joyce. Um, Rhiannon was curious about some of the details on um, the outreach. So first, um, was the field assessment with stakeholders open to the general public or additional members of the listed affinity groups? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the field assessment with the stakeholders was uh, only open to the uh, 
the stakeholder groups that I mentioned. Um, and that is because we had a limited number of parcels and a limited amount of time. Um, and so first we had to provide the training before you could go out to do the assessment. So we were capped by how many people showed up at the training and the communications with those individuals in advance was obviously you know, from our um, email lists. Um, they were also the ones we originally briefed on the project as we were selected um, by the MVP. So by far they had the most amount of background about, about the details of the project and what it would involve. Um, I would have probably loved to open it up uh, further, but again, we had a limited number of parcels and a limited amount of time that we had to part, you know, sort of visit. We had to do the work in December before it got too cold and the ground was too frozen. Um, and, you know, the project sort of kicked off in September. So there was a limited amount of time to select these individuals. Uh, and so we chunked it out. Each of the group subgroups went out and visited these parcels and uh, did the field assessment and was like a group of three to four individuals. And that that sweet spot of about 20 uh, worked out worked out really well for that day. Great, thank you. Um, and then another follow-up question uh, from Rhiannon, did the art contest come after the youth statement on climate or were they not initially related? So just a little bit about kind of the, the process of involving the youth. Yeah, I think that the involvement of youth uh, was really something I very much wanted to do. I feel like they're equal stakeholders um, to me uh, and that their voices are so often left out. Uh, so I, tried multiple ways to get the youth uh, involved. Um, the art contest was one facet of it. The youth statement, they did that on their own. They decided they mm -hmm. wanted to come together and do a youth statement by themselves. Um, so it was not, a, not something I had originally foreseen, uh, but it was something a very, very grassroots and very organic. Uh, so though, no, they were completely initially unrelated. Um, at the climate summit, we um, gave awards out to the art contest winners. Um, and then the youth statement was read and presented uh, by the students just prior to that. So they were, you know, timing wise was similar, but um, it, was, it was not foreseen as a package deal. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, that's, that's so great that that kind of happened um, spontaneously for the project. Yeah. Um, Andrew, do we, how much time do we have? Um, we, have we have a little more time. Um, we can do, we okay. can do a, few more, a few more questions. I have, okay. I have one question. Where do we find the youth statement? I want, I want, to, I want to read this youth statement. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, it is on our um, town website under sustainability and uh, climate summit. Um, all of the slides, presentations, um, uh, even some photographs uh, are memorialized uh, on that website, including the, the youth statement. Happy to um, put it into the chat when I, when I get a chance uh, so that people can come visit it. Great, thanks. So if we have one more question, we can do one more question if that works. Um, sure, yeah, it doesn't look like we have any more specific questions um, in the chat. Um, some general comments from Julie about um, the importance of uh, experts in, in community engagement um, and in consulting. So I think um, that is, uh, thank you for those thoughts, Julie. Um, I think, uh, you know, to hit on some of the overarching themes between our presentations, um, Joyce, would you have any advice for folks who are looking to start the kinds of partnerships that have helped you do, do this work? Um, you know, you know, I know they can take a very long time to establish. So if, if folks out there are kind of looking to, to dip their toe in, what do you have an idea on a, a great first step for them? Yeah, I, I think again, you have to have a willingness to move beyond your comfort zone. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, by being open and transparent about the project, um, being willing to give, you know, sort of seminars to people that might have very little um, idea of, of the project and climate change in general and the, the, the resilience um, 
you know, I, I think of all of the events and coordination that we have done, probably the hardest one was at that uh, Greater Lawrence Boathouse, right? Because people are there for a completely different reason. They're, they're learning mm. about summer programs for their kids and, and boating. Um, but, you know, it's surprising because if you open up, they're more open to visiting you too. And we had so many visitors that Bob and I chatted with um, about different things. And it's uh, making sure that, you know, your approach is open uh, and making sure that um, you make it as accessible for people and the audience as possible and trying to make that connection of this is why it matters to you. We had some some great conversations. Um, this year we had a, a beer fest along the Shawshank too, uh, different clientele of course, <laughs> um, but great conversations and great feedback as well. So uh, being open to those opportunities, I think is, is um, something that I would definitely say is important. Great, thank you very much. Um, do we have time for one more, Andrew, or should we? Yeah, let's bump that question to the end because it probably has some overarching um, um, relevance to all yeah. of our projects. So that challenges, yeah, absolutely. So you know, we've we've thrown some models at you of how to pull partnerships together uh, and how these partnerships can represent like a source of strength for confronting a, a shared community um, uh, climate vulnerability. But there is always going to be like some glue or some duct tape or some some tools that need to be used to help hold these. Um, partnership together. And um, that's why we're we're going to have um, Melissa Preventer from BRPC uh, talk to you guys um, about some tools and techniques that have worked uh, across multiple scales for some uh, uh, complicated partnerships. So keep keep partnerships in your mind as you listen and then think about how you can you can apply um, these tools to your partnerships that you're going to form in your exciting action grants. So with that, I'm going to go over to uh, Melissa. Hi everyone, thank you for having me here today. Um, as Andrew said, my name is Melissa Preventure and I am the Environmental and Energy Program Manager at the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. So I represent the westernmost county of the Commonwealth. And um, as Andrew said, my presentation is a bit different in that I'm not going to be talking about a specific project or projects, but just more of the concepts of managing complex partnerships. For um, a little bit of background, I've been involved in several different MVP action grants, um, most of which have included multiple partners. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I'd be happy to answer questions that are specific to those projects or those particular partners. Um, but just to give a general idea, um, with one of those projects, um, I've worked with um, over six communities, three nonprofits, two regional planning agencies, one government entity and one educational institution. Um, with another, it was four communities, four nonprofits, one regional planning agency, one educational institution, and over three community-based organizations. Um, next slide. So based on my experience when establishing partnerships, it is really important to, um, if you can, identify potential partners early, recognize that you need to establish clear communication establish roles and expectations, understand potential limitations, and acknowledge, respect, and appreciate one another's differences. So the sooner you can identify the partners, the sooner you can start building out the framework um, or an outline of a project from a concept to a full vision. Each partner has the potential to impact another, um, whether it's because their missions or their other work overlap, or they have an ability to work together. Um, they may also be able to build off one another's strengths, whether it's through previous work, current ongoing work, or future plans. So by establishing the partnerships early, you can really set the stage, um, really start to build out that framework to a full vision. And it's important, again, to establish that clear communication and the roles and expectations. Um, it's also important to recognize that the roles and expectations are important at both the project development or grant writing stage as well as the project implementation stage. Um, again, clear communication. So in relation to potential limitations, it's also important, um, and this is just one example, but with the MVP program, the eligible applicants are government entities. Um, and so there are certain constraints that government entities will have to operate under. Um, one example is that 
um, the lead applicant is likely to have to procure the services of potential partners. Maybe each individual partner might need to be procured. Um, establishing the par partnerships early on and naming partners within a proposal don't necessarily negate the need for an open procurement process. Um, so that can be a challenge that needs to be overcome. Um, it is possible to conduct that open procurement prior to beginning the application stage or prior to the award, but oftentimes partners are reluctant or hesitant to uh, work on a proposal and submit a proposal when funding is still speculative. Um, another thing to be thinking about is where potential match is coming from. The MVP program requires non-state match. Um, so what source of match you, you are bringing to the table might also have implications on the um, nature of the partnership and the complexities that you would see. So whether it's because match is coming from various partners or whether it's because as a non-state match, it's coming from potentially a federal source, federal procurement, federal uh, grants or uh, federal funds will come with different requirements. Federal procurement has different requirements. So there needs to be a certain amount of, like I said, understanding of limitations and an acknowledgement and a respect and an appreciation for the differences. Um, the requirements will often slow things down, especially in comparison from how a government entity is able to function versus how maybe a nonprofit, for example, is able to function. So again, it comes down to um, being patient, acknowledging and respecting those differences. Um, it's also important to, you know, as I mentioned, nonprofits are an example of functioning in a way that's different from a government entity. We all come from different backgrounds, um, different missions and objectives, um, and also have different requirements that we need to meet. So recognizing our differences is very important. Um, next slide. So once you receive an award, you need to think about how to manage the project. I've already touched upon the idea of procuring the services of the partners. Um, this can be done in a multitude of different ways. Um, as I just said, if federal funds are involved as well, that certainly needs to be taken into consideration. Um, there's also the potential that some services could be um, secured through just sound business practices. Um, there's also the potential to procure services as a sole source, um, but that also has limitations as well. Um, another option is for partners to come together for the lead entity to issue a single procurement and have a project team respond to that. So all the partners need to kind of think about what might work best for them when ultimately responding to and implementing and managing the project. Um, <clears throat> then, um, as the slide says, with multi-year projects, you have to think about your fiscal year budgets. With the MVP program, the fiscal year budgets are critical. Um, it is really important, as I said before, when establishing good communication to make sure that the partners are all aware of the importance of these separate and distinct budgets um, and to plan ahead. So one of the pitfalls that I mentioned earlier is that sometimes things get slowed down whether it's because of the match complications or just because of the difference of a government entity and those hoops that have to be jumped through requirements that need to be followed. There's also the fact that if that creates a slowdown in the earlier stage of the project when things are first awarded, if a procurement has to be undertaken, then there may be less that can be accomplished in that first year than you might otherwise be thinking if you think you can just hit the ground running. So that definitely needs to be taken into consideration as you structure the different budgets. Um, and then as you implement the project, in some ways it's almost easier to look at them as two sort of separate projects with one phase and then another because those budgets do really need to be so separate and distinct. Um, and that also includes tracking the match for those two different fiscal years. Um, uh, match is the next um, item I had on the slide and tracking is the next thing I, I had. So with the match commitment, regardless of the fiscal year implication, it's still important that the partners, if they're bringing match to the table, track that match so that that can be reported. It's also important to understand that whichever lead entity is the lead entity in this and your project, or if um, another group has been uh, procured to serve in the management capacity for that, it's important to recognize that that entity will need to compile all of that 
and track all of that and ultimately report all of that. Um, action grants require monthly reporting, which can sometimes be met for the process of doing holding multi monthly meetings. Um, but this also um, requires that each partner um, be willing and able and patient enough to either provide a monthly reporting of their activities, which will then need to be compiled and submitted by the lead entity or the management entity, um, or by meeting monthly, it does mean that the partners will need to be um, willing and open to attend regular monthly meetings and that somebody will need to serve the role of um, organizer in organizing those meetings. And oftentimes that also results in um, not just organizing the meeting, but meeting notes and kind of tracking um, the sort of next steps and roles and responsibilities following those meetings. Um, I also have mentioned that um, we need to be you know, cognizant of one another's differences. So next slide. Another way that we have differences is I've you know, mentioned the government entity versus a nonprofit, but it can also be challenging when working with some smaller community-based organizations. And in some cases, we may be identifying partners at a later stage in the project rather than early on. It may even be the intent that we would be hoping to identify additional partners and wanting to be able to include them by providing them you know, a stipend or you know, certainly you know, reimbursing them for their costs for their participation or expenses that they may incur. That being said, with some of the smaller groups, it may be difficult for them to um, manage a traditional uh, contract or accept funds in a traditional way. So we need to come up with alternatives and we need to think outside the box in these cases. Some examples that we've found that have been effective have been to uh, purchase supplies or equipment for a community-based organization that are relevant to the project work that's being performed, um, to sponsor um, an event that's being conducted uh, by one of the community-based organizations that would be featuring the project. Um, provide assistance to increase the participation in an event that's relative to the project. So by doing coupons or by um, serving, um, by funding a dinner or beverages, non-alcoholic of course, um, and other things like that are just to, to name a few of the different ways that you can sort of think outside of the box um, as to how you may be able to accommodate some of these smaller groups that might not be able to function in those traditional ways. Um, and next slide for questions. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, that was like a great overview of like the nuts and bolts um, for partnerships um, that, you know, you might not always think of um, when, when going down this road. So, you know, thank you. We, we really appreciate that. Um, does anyone have any other questions for Melissa? Um, we did have a question from Susan on kind of defining open procure procurement. Um, whenever we at MVP get questions about procurement, we always just refer folks back to their particular municipality um, because you know it, it can differ. Um, but I will also just turn that question to you, Melissa, to see if you had any anything to add. Yes, so um, municipalities and regional planning agencies, um, other government entities oftentimes have to follow for services, Mass General Law Chapter 30B. Um, and so depending on the value of the contract, we may be able to um, conduct what's called sound business practices, which is sort of knowing what those typical services would cost and being able to accept um, a um, sort of enter into a contract that is consistent with those costs. But as the dollar amounts get higher, then we need to follow additional requirements, which could be as much as um, posting within the local paper, posting within goods and services, um, require, putting together a written requirement or written specs for someone to bid on, um, and then also having um, receiving sealed um, proposals and sealed bids. So it really varies depending on what the requirement, um, what the dollar amount of the contract is. Um, for partnerships where there's no funds being brought to the table, um, then that simplifies things a great deal. 
Um, but when a partner is being, you know, reimbursed in some way through the grant funds, then we need to be thinking about this procurement element. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Betsy about um, partners, you know, what if a partner drops out or disbands during the project? Um, will, could it affect um, the grant? Um, is that something you've seen in your experiences, Melissa? Um, I have not seen that in um, an MVP grant, but I have been doing this for over 20 years. Um, and we have had instances where um, we have had changes like that. And when that happens, it's critical to work with um, whichever funding entity you're working with. So in the case of MVP, although this hasn't happened, um, I know that I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to Carrie Ann and you know, talk about what's going on and brainstorm together and come up with um, alternatives. Um, I think that the important thing is that the work be done and it be done as um, it was competitively bid in the MVP project. So it doesn't necessarily have to be undertaken by the same individual group that um, had initially planned to undertake that. But as long as that work can be completed, that's the most important thing. Right, right. It always comes back to the deliverables for MVP. Um, so as long as those deliverables can be produced. Um, okay. Um, any other, I'm not seeing any other questions specifically for Melissa. Um, should we open it up at this point, Andrew, to our broader discussion? Um, I think this is the time to do it. Yeah. So we can kind of bring right. everybody back. We can have this brainstorm where all these good ideas come together and then they, they go forward. And this is the time. So um, awesome. So everybody is ready from our presentations. You know, you've had your coffee, you're unmuted, you're back in the room. Um, now's the time. So Great. let's hear it. I think I want to start with um, Pallavi has asked a few times a very important question about unexpected challenges that have come up. Um, so I would like to direct that to, to any of you really, Plymouth folks, um, Joyce or Melissa, um, you know, during your project and in your experiences, um, what were some unexpected challenges um, that you've faced and, and how were they addressed? I would say this is Frank Mann from the Pine Barren Alliance and our subterranean resilience, that it's it's nothing but unex, uh, <laughs> unexpected things, especially when, you know, we, as Lee was saying, we have over a dozen partners and uh, how each of them finds a way to integrate what they do normally into the uh, objectives of the project is sometimes a pleasant surprise, sometimes an unnerving surprise, but I think that ultimately you have to be able to adapt to those things because if you have true community participation, uh, you don't want you don't really want to be directing them exactly what to do. You want them to find how it's relevant relevant to them. So we it, it, they were all surprises. Essentially, the League of Women Voters created their read up storm project out of you know whole cloth. They they uh, they just came up with that idea. We wanted them to participate. They were a, a partner that committed to a certain level of you know match and things, but the act, actual specifics evolved with the project. We knew maybe our project is a little unusual in that it's kind of bifurcated. That is, we have this scientific hydrogeological study of uh, you know the potential ramifications of saltwater intrusion on our coastline, and then we have outreach almost you know going on a separate channel um so the two can two can happen at once um uh, but again the outreach um was a surprise uh and evolved as we went through and i think that's that's a, a good test of if people are really involved if you're really um getting that outreach or that full participation and we were pleasantly surprised but probably shouldn't have been because these were established organizations that we knew could contribute materially to this effort. Great, thank you, Frank. I like that. They're they're all kind of unexpected challenges um, in a way. Um, so you know that is uh, 
always particularly a challenge when you have a deliverable based scope oriented grant. Um, so kind of being able to strike that balance um, is definitely a, a skill um, that, that can come over time. Um, any other unexpected challenges that folks um, want to share about? I would just say that, you know, I, I focused my presentation on the, the, you know, areas that I did based on experience, which means that some of those were experiences where they did present challenges that I've learned from. Um, so, you know, definitely trying to make sure that you have really thought out your project, including your project budget and those that fiscal year breakdown and what can really be accomplished within each year and doing that in a way where you're recognizing that you might not be able to hit the ground running, that there may be some things that slow down that first year. That's definitely become a real learning experience for us. Um, I think we've gotten a lot better at it because we've learned from it, um, but there have definitely been challenges in that um, area for us before. Um, and, and how to deal with any of these things with the MVP program in particular, working with your regional coordinator, I think is the best advice that I could give anybody. Um, you know, working with your team, of course, is important and critical. And if you have a single lead entity or an entity that's serving in a management role as Berks Regional Planning Commission often does, you know, that's definitely important, but ultimately we're gonna go back to our regional coordinator and keeping the regional coordinator informed as things happen is really important um, because an, any issue can be addressed so much easier if it's brought to their attention early on rather than trying to kind of stumble through it on your own um, and then have it become a larger problem that has a lot less um, opportunity for correction or a lot fewer options to correct it. Absolutely. Uh, I, I have one more thing to add to all of that, which is that, and this is unfortunately has happened this year, um, particularly, you know, when you're working with students uh, and younger folks, um, make sure you know the rules of engagement, you know, sort of upfront. Um, we had this idea of working with the Greater Lawrence Technical School, uh, particularly on this phase of the project, which is a sort of an environmental engineering um, discipline that I know the Greater Lawrence Technical School is trying to grow expertise on. And um, I didn't ask for, we were thinking that the student could serve, you know, as our community liaison. Um, <laughs> because ideally the student would be bilingual, they would give us greater access to um, the Lawrence community, whom you know, uh, the community will be affected by these projects. Uh, but the paperwork, I should have asked for the paperwork in advance mm -hmm. of working with a student, because if I had seen the paperwork, instead of just leaving it off last year during the EOI process, um, oh yeah, we can do this and everybody gets excited and about partnerships. And had I seen the paperwork and what it takes to hire an intern from and what that internship looks like and the mentorship, the space needs, the you know sort of the working condition environment documentation, I would have realized it just, it probably takes about four or five months just to document the condition of, you know, on the employment, actually. It's like an employment. Uh, and I would have realized it doesn't fit in our project timeline. So um, make sure to ask for these clarifications as you're formulating, because um, I think you're going to realize like some things are as much as you want them to happen, you know, as much as everyone agrees it might be a brilliant idea, uh, just may not work in the context of the project. So <laughs> ask to see those sooner rather than later. <laughs> I'm gonna jump in. This is Judy Savage um, from the League of Women Voters in Plymouth. And I, I think this was actually mentioned by both Melissa and Joyce in their projects. Um, there are, when you're collaborating, there are real cultural differences between 
all these different groups. The town government has its own operating culture and protocols. The um, nonprofits um, that don't have to operate under the same protocols have that as well. In even between those nonprofits, they have different protocols in how they operate, working with youth, working with the Wampanoag community. And we're, we want to be respectful, but we don't always um, know even the right questions to ask. So that coordinating group, and in our case was SEMPA, Frank's group, really does the heavy lifting on trying to make it all work. But we were learning as we went along and we're still learning. And we had a lot of hopes to be even more collaborative, um, but didn't have the time um, in this project to really work through all of that. So I, 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 and again, that's something we're learning. How do we work through that? How do we bring people to the table? How do we bring people to the table in a way that is respectful of their ways of operating? And um, it, 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 it was a challenge. It's actually, pretty amazing how much we all accomplished given that challenge. I think one of the things we did actually is, as Frank was referring to, we kind of did our own thing within our particular group and then tried to meld it all together. But I think ideally, if we could even go the next few steps of being able to integrate some of those projects um, would be even more fruitful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, Gloriana, do you want to go ahead? I just wanted to mention one thing. You also sometimes, rather than it being a difficulty, something happens and it's a surprise almost. <laughs> and uh, I, I think uh, I happened to be at Frank's headquarters when um, he had some students that were taking data for him on these ponds and he'd set up a an interaction with David Bout. Um, and all of a sudden you had these high school students who were getting the lowdown on the hydraulic systems of Plymouth, learning from somebody who's used to teaching, um, you know, certainly undergraduates, but also graduate students. And they were getting sort of the deep dive. And it was so beautiful. It was, um, you know, their their learning opportunity was just it was just in a moment able to coordinate. Uh, Frank was able to coordinate this meeting. It was great. Well, I, I see, Bob, I see you have a question uh, you'd like to be unmuted. Um, I just want to make sure that we go through the, the questions that were submitted in the chat before we go to any audio questions. I just want to make sure we exhaust that opportunity before we, we move into uh, any any verbal questions. Does that sound good for everyone? Thumbs up? Right, so, um, so I just wanted to interject with that one point, but uh, proceed to the root camera. Thanks, Andrew. Any other responses to unexpected challenges? Um, I'm hearing some really important themes about leaving enough time, understanding the um, the administrative end of having a partnership. Um, you know, these are all really good tips that I'm also absorbing as a regional coordinator so that I can um, further guide people. Um, Melissa. Yeah, I, I just wanna say quickly, I think it's really important as well that we don't forget that we're coming out of a pandemic. I really <laughs> feel that the last, this, this all launched right as we were all like slapped with COVID. And I think we really need to applaud everyone for working and doing the work that they have done, because we all know it would have looked very, very different had we not been doing this during this time. So I just, I think that's really important to note and just give everybody the, the room to say, you know, if even if there were some struggles during this time, we are, as I keep saying, getting back into balance. I think everyone has been affected in some way. So I don't wanna neglect to add that. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point um, that, you know, partnerships have definitely changed uh, form and look different now than they used to uh, for better or for worse. Um, I think 
one, um, I'm, I'm just looking back through the questions that we received earlier um, during Plymouth's talk. Um, and, you know, there's, there were a lot of handful of questions about whether your partnerships that we've discussed so far were formed before you put together an MVP action grant application, um, or were they put together kind of in order to create the application, um, kind of what, so I guess the general question would be, what was the timing like in terms of forming partnerships, doing MVP, um, and what kind of advice do you, would you have around, around that? Well, everyone would like to have more time. Um, <laughs> we, we actually, I hate, to, I don't, almost don't want to admit it, but we heard that uh, the town uh, had put forth some ideas to, uh, to the regional coordinator, I believe, and they were told, I think, straightforward that that didn't seem like a likely success. And so very uh, close to the actual deadline, we heard that they there was not going to be a town application for an action grant. So we had just, it was serendipity in, a lar in large part, we had just begun to get evidence of saltwater intrusion or the effects of sea level rise at local ponds and had done some research into saltwater intrusion that's an international global problem. Um, so we acted very quickly. And so the fact that we already had relationships with most of the partners that we um, eventually made official partners of this project was, was critical. Uh, and again, if, if we, I suppose if we had a lot of time, we would have brought most of these same partners on in, in a plan. But I, I, I kind of like the fact that we, again, allowed them to evolve their own uh, level of and, and distinct kind of participation in this. But um, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was around the timing of like when your partnerships were formed yeah. versus when you created the MVP grant I, I and they were pre-existing in your case. So I kind of think, yeah, and I think that's a valuable lesson that um, for community groups, and this was essentially spearheaded by SEMPA initially, um, for community groups to um, have these kinds of complex partnerships, they should rely on those, those organizations they have affinities for or, or have worked on before. Um, uh, there needs to be a kind of level of trust. It's a little bit different, I think, or very different when a project is conceived and you go looking for your outreach partners, uh, then you're, it's a, it's a different uh, dynamic. So we, we really had established relationships with most of the groups that were participating in this one way or another. And I think a lot of communities have that. And I think one of the lessons that I think is really important is that, or that MVP should look maybe a little bit more towards community groups as the originators of these concepts, um, not necessarily municipalities. You, just, you know, um, there's a lot of towns and cities that have done a great job in this and it's very important work. At the same time, if outreach really is important, then begin with the, the community, not necessarily with professional staff and people like that. Uh, they, they view it a little bit differently. Um, and I, I just think that's, it's, to some degree more authentic and uh, you'll get some, uh, you'll get real participation um, that that lasts. You know, I, I think we're coming out of this with these great relationships with a lot of the groups that we already had relationships with, but they've evolved and we can see how we can each contribute to the whole community's betterment by participating together. I just want <clears throat> to interject really quick and say, I couldn't have made a better plug for MVP 2.0 if I tried. <laughs> So um, that's going to be uh, kind of a focus of that program is really building these relationships um, and allowing the space to do that over uh, the course of um, a year or a couple of years. So um, that's the intention with that program. And um, uh, we hope that that will help uh, a little bit with um, some of these building partnership struggles. But um, yeah, I just wanted to, to say that really quickly in case anyone was on the fence about wanting to pilot that program with us. <laughs> okay, so I think we have um, we have about 11 more minutes. Carolyn, I believe you have uh, a, a one or two more questions you're going to work through, and then we can open the floor to a round robin uh, question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, I think we've gone through 
most, if not all of the questions we had received, um, or at least, you know, a lot of them were, were related, if not verbatim. Um, but one question that I had, and it, it comes from, I think it was Judy's response in the chat um, about the fact that a lot of these issues that you're reaching out to the community about are very big issues. They can evoke a lot of emotional reactions in folks. You know, when you're talking about saltwater intrusion, you're talking about flooding. Um, and, you know, you, you have all these great partners on board um, to help you with these conversations. Um, but do you have, you know, some, uh, any advice or recommendations as to how to approach these really difficult topics without scaring people or potential partners away from, from the work? Well, you know, having even, you know, just working on climate action in general in the community, um, there's an evolution, I think, partly because of the news, um, but there's an evolution of awareness where I think the focus of a lot of our work was initially making people aware, you know, it's like running around like Chicken Little saying the sky is falling. But I think what, what many of us are finding is that that actually discourages people from coming out um, mm -hmm. or attending meetings. So um, we're, we're, there's the shift, I think, among a lot of community groups, and not just community groups, but I think others as well, to start um, framing um, our work in terms of solutions, um, to really um, engage people with like, both the accomplishments that we've been making, the towns have been making. I mean, I, I love the ideas of doing these climate summits and awarding people for the work that they do and featuring, look how much your town is engaged in doing. And, and I think we all need to um, recognize, we need to build that in um, because that actually will help people um, be, I think, be able to get involved and, and do what they need to do. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Judy. Yes. Judy, that's perfect because I think that's one of the most important things um, that we try to accomplish here in the program is that overcoming that paralysis of like feeling like climate change is, I mean, is too big for people to confront, but like getting people to lean in direction and take action and begin to confront this challenge, I think it's really, what you said is really key because you're, you're encapsulating some of the, like, the, the wisdom that we want people to, to take away uh, from these webinars. So thank you for your statement. All right. Um, so Bob, uh, what, what is your question, sir? I've made you a co-host now and you can now unmute. Not a question, a comment. Um, we've done extensive outreach in Hamden and we have a partnership MVP with uh, East Long Meadow. And we've had a fair amount of success engaging the public. What has tripped us up recently though, is uh, not insufficient engagement of other municipal departments. And um, although we invited uh, representatives from our parks and recreation department, to a number of sessions. We've targeted two places to establish pollinator gardens, one of which is in Memorial Park alongside a wonderful little stream where everyone agreed it would, it would be just perfect. Um, problem was a park and rec chose not to send a representative and we just kept going down the track. Conservation Commission was on board and others. And finally, the Parks Department got involved and said, well, you can't do it there because it's right next to a, an area where lots of children play, and we don't want any bees near where children are playing. So it undid the whole effort there. And then I think what they said to us made sense, but we should have made a better effort, I think, to engage them in the process uh, as it was evolving rather than wait until uh, it was decision time, final decision time, and only to get them to step in and say, 
this will not work as far as we're concerned. So municipal departments operating in silos is a, a common problem we have in the Commonwealth. In, any Absolutely. recommendations for bringing municipal partners uh, into the process um, so that well, those departments go and knock on their door and make sure that they're going to step in and help out as opposed to sending them email messages or informing them that there's a meeting. I think it's personal engagement that's necessary. Uh, I mean, partly because uh, in a smaller municipality, people are volunteers on the park commission. They're volunteers, they have one staffer. Uh, usually there's staffers are part-time. And so I don't think it was uh, that they deliberately ignored us that we didn't go out of our way to engage them sufficiently. I, I think that's a real a real issue. And we're, we're very fortunate in Plymouth. Um, we have some very experienced people um, that have been on staff for a long time that are uh, well connected to the nonprofit communities in the town as well. But I can definitely see that without that, um, uh, that it would be a difficult, uh, it'd be a maze to navigate through. Our, our particular project requires a lot of science, a lot of data, and uh, though we had the participation and, and commitment of the planning staff uh, through Mr. Hartman, um, we didn't have necessarily the green light to go to the health board and say, give us all your well data uh, and things like that. And there was some hesitance there uh, because we were outside of that. So I, th I think that's a good lesson that um, because these, I'm not sure that's going to change in terms of every, you know, has to be sponsored by a municipality. Um, that's as much of a financial thing as anything. Um, so you're going to have to work with the community and the community is going to have to work with you. So spending some time, I wish we had more time probably to lay the groundwork to work more closely with the town. Uh, fortunately, again, Mr. Hartman is an experienced person who's been through all of the MVP projects. Um, and had the experience so they could facilitate it to, to a large degree, but it's something that we probably should have spent more time on up front. And if I could, Lee Hartman, um, yeah, to speak to that too, I think what's most important in each town is different. You have select boards, you have strong town managers, town administrators, city councils. So each one's a little different, but I would say that having the leadership engaged and supportive even if it's a passive, supportive is very important. So to have that uh, early on buy-in by whoever's the person in charge, in my case, town manager, select board, that they're either supportive of this or, um, or, or at least um, don't object to it. And having that kind of power behind you from the leadership is so important to making a project move. Absolutely. Thank you for... For those comments, um, Bob, I appreciate that. Let's not forget about the internal partnerships that are just as important for moving things forward um, as these external partnerships that were that were you know highlighting um, this morning. Um, and Susan left a comment about uh, you know going to different town committee meetings um, to really get in front of them and that you know as you said, Bob, basically knocking on their door. Um, and now that we're kind of in this changing landscape where a little bit more is in person, um, you know, this, this is always looking different to uh, go back to uh, Melissa's comment on, on the pandemic. Um, we're in the last two minutes here. So Andrew, I think I'll turn it back to, to you. At last two minutes. Thanks. I wanted to say that um, Bob's comment made me think of something, which is that MVP program, we're all about trying different things out. So if you try something out, and it turns out it doesn't work out, uh, then that's not necessarily a failure. You were trying something out and you can explain to somebody else what did and what didn't work. And you can say, hey, it didn't work because we didn't do this. And that information is so valuable too because someone else can take it and say, hey, I'm not gonna do it that way, I'll do it this way. So yeah, no no hard feelings if it if it's not working all the time. Uh, we just wanna make sure we're, we're accomplishing the deliverables. That's my caveat on that. Um, so we have come to the end of our time. Uh, it's almost noon right now. And we have um, 
we've, we've covered so much ground together. And I just want everybody to know that you're more than welcome to come back next week, same time, same place, when we um, go into our heat waves and a change climate topic. We're gonna have an excellent program. We have some exciting uh, presentations about what's being done in the Boston area and then out in the sort of air Devons area, um, Chelsea, Boston and air to uh, talk about um, things that are being done to mitigate and address the um, fact that heat waves have completely changed in New England uh, in the past 20 years. So, Andrew, please, I would just say same same time, but different link. <laughs> so Sorry. Sorry. Make sure Good you point. register for that that meeting separately. That's correct. And that's that's it. That's that's all. That's all I've got today. Um, just thanks for joining us. Look forward to this YouTube out there in the world. You can watch this again on YouTube to um, to relive the highs. So just yeah, we'll post this on our website in the coming weeks, so you can look look for it there. Awesome. Bye, folks. Thanks, thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.